Hey, Meeps, we're here at Origins 2015 with James Ernest of Cheap Ass Games. Uh, and James is really one of the pioneers of the grassroots game design industry. When he started, when did you start this whole Cheap I Ass started, Games? I uh, started, Cheap Ass Games I started in 1996. Yeah, and that's probably around when I started actually getting into games. And my friend handed me an envelope full of almost nothing. There were rules and there were chits to cut and there were things to make, which actually reminded me of Dragon Magazine when I used to cut yeah. all the games from like Tom uh, Tom Wham and stuff like that out. Um, and it had no dice and it had no pawns, but they were great games. And, and Kill Dr. Lucky uh, was one of the games that I think really first got me back into gaming after, into tabletop board gaming after many, many years of miniature war gaming and role-playing games. I just didn't have the time for that anymore and I was looking for something else and so there's the, the new wave of German games and these. These things were sort of that almost next step of the American games. Um, so not Monopoly and not Acquire, even though I mean I love Sid Saxon games. And yeah, the, the phrase at the time that people were throwing around was American German games. American German it games. It was, you know, to take some of the the grown-up tactics and strategy of German games, but then bring them to an American sensibility, which has a little more, you know, I, this is, I'm repeating what I heard, but, you know, more <laughs> flavor and more character and more story-driven. I, I would agree with that. Yeah. And why did you go the way of the cheap-ass route? Uh, necessity, really. I, I, I started Cheap-Ass Games as a way to publish a bunch of games that I couldn't otherwise sell. I had sort of worked in the hobby game industry for a few years, and I'd seen the torturous process that a new game goes through mm -hmm. trying to get published. And I had a lot of game designs, mm -hmm. and just way more. I, nobody knew who I was. So I wanted to make a lot of games, that's step one. Step two is I didn't have a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And step three is that the market at the time had kind of a gulf under $10. Like there had been cheap game lines in the past, mm -hmm. but at that very moment there was sort of an arms race in production values that was just lifting everything off the ground, and so nobody was filling a $10 and under niche. And so I could print a game on my laser printer, I could be proud of how cheap it was, and I could uh, uh, sort of sell it cheap when no one else was doing that. So that's, that's sort of the ins where Cheap Ass Games came from. Right. And tell me some of the, the titles that really were landmark titles for Cheap Ass. Well, we had like a, a half a dozen, me and my playtesters had like a half a dozen games to choose from for the first year's worth of Cheap Ass games, and I printed a lot of those in like late 96. Kill Dr. Lucky was number one among that group, mm -hmm. and so it was our flagship from the beginning. And it's still, you know, one of the best. You're coming up to the 20th anniversary? Yeah, it's it's actually the 19th anniversary, but the thing's out of print and I want to bring it back. So, like, <laughs> so we'll we're, call it the 20th anniversary. I, we're, talking, we're joking about calling it the 19 and a half anniversary edition. But I, I think but you should do that. It's fun to say. Here's the problem. it's You can't write it. There's no good no, way to write 19 there's... and a half anniversary edition that people will read it right. And that's no, that's actually the stuff right. block. And I'm sure Googling that will not be Right. So, so anyway, Kill Dr. Lucky was in that block. The number two game was Before I Kill You, Mr. Bond, which we knew we were right. going to sell on, uh, on theme. Late, we didn't do any more games that were like that, that like piggyback on existing storylines. Mm -hmm. And we knew that with Bond, we were eventually going to get a letter. And we, we, you know, <laughs> and you? eight years later, we got a letter. Eight. Um, oh, that's pretty good. It was pretty good. And uh, that was that was a. I'll tell that's you that whole story if you want to hear it. But like, we had to shut that down. But <laughs> the other the other ones from that era were like, get out the story about trying to move out of your parents' basement and get a job. <laughs> I do not have that one. It's like Monopoly on three tracks. And you have to get, have get a job and then get an apartment and then like have a life. Yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. so it's like Monopoly right, plus right, life. Right, I've right, never right. heard of that. That's incredible. Um, uh, we did uh, Bleeding Sherwood, which oh, is the story of a uh, traveling salesman following Robin Hood through Sherwood <laughs> Forest. Because he's giving all the poor people a bunch of money that they have no idea right, what to do and so... with. And you're selling them crap they don't need. Uh, <laughs> awesome. Great story, not a great game. Uh, well, uh, we that had, we learned an important away. lesson on Bleeding Sherwood, which was that. I had tested that with the same group mm. for a long time, and they were really good at it. And when you're good at that game, sure. it's an amazing bluffing game. Yeah. 
Right. But when you're not good at it and you play it stupid, you don't realize that you're playing it stupid. That's a really good point. Yeah, and and I got you know professional reviewers who would play it once and and then dish on it, and I was like, but you're playing it wrong, and they're like, that's not the point. No, I need to play it wrong and, and enjoy it, and mm. that's totally right. So mm -hmm. so I love the story of Bleeding Sherwood, and I would love to make it into a board game or something because the idea of being a traveling mm -hmm. salesman and selling junk to poor that people is, is just like hilarious. That is funny. Yes, that is really a lot funny. of our games are about being the bad guy. Yeah. Um, and you kill Dr. Lucky is like Dr. Lucky is not evil. We're no. the bad people. Yes, in that, and in try that to story. kill him. Um, he's just, you know, Mr. <laughs> Magoo. And he's wandering around and he's, yeah. he doesn't know what's going on. <laughs> people keep trying to kill him and he has no idea what's happening. So, you know, it's fun to be the bad guy. And that's that was the basis of in, in, in Bond, you're the villain. Mm -hmm. In Bleeding Sherwood, you're the villain. I mean, in Get Out, you're like the kid who. Is still living in his parents' basement, so like, yeah. I guess not. So you're kind of the still... anti-hero, right, right? Right, right, right. <laughs> and then uh, Lord of the Fries. Lord of the Fries was Lord of the Fries and Give Me the Brain were like the, in the first two years, and mm -hmm. those have been evergreens as well. Um, they're both oh. about zombies working in a fast food restaurant with only one brain to pass mm. around, mm -hmm. and you know, in that game, you're not the villain; you're just dumb, <laughs> <laughs> just really dumb. Yeah, and. Lord of the Fries, we just kickstarted that. I'm working on it. Mm -hmm. uh, the graphic design I'm working on right now, it's going to go to press in a couple of weeks. Nice. Um, really excited about that. That's coming out in September with not just the core game, but standalone expansion packs of all different restaurants. Oh, cool. So, what we used to do different restaurants by mixing and matching the same cards. Now we've done new art for the Mexican and the Italian and the <laughs> Irish pub and all these different places. New art, new menus, new everything. It's a it's a the game's just exploded and it's really cool. Quick question: Where do your ideas come from? Because you uh, have some a, amazing. There's stuff. a phone number you can call. <laughs> it's there's a little old lady in Germany and she she just you have to know have someone who knows German because okay. she kind of just just has good ideas. Right. You just call her up and you listen for twenty minutes and you take notes and it's like, like oh, accent. It's a whole year's right. worth of game ideas. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's it's German. Like mm -hmm. I needed I needed a German friend to help me get all these ideas. Some of your favorite titles, or my favorite titles from you, uh, Lightspeed. Uh huh. I just love the idea. I love using an elastic. Yeah. To trace line of sight. Right. As right. a war gamer, right? you're always like getting down there and measuring with a measuring tape, and then having arguments right. because oh, no, it's not line of sight. But with Lightspeed, you're doing stuff kind of real time, kind well, of stopping, and, and then everything's boom, there it is. flat. And it's pretty easy to measure yeah. the lines. You just hold it up, and you can see the shadow. Yeah. So yeah, the, the rubber band in that is a, it's a great invention. I, in Lightspeed, and in Diceland, which came out around right. the same yep. time, it's all about relative distance and, and, mm -hmm. and direction. It's not about measuring distances, mm -hmm. but like which one is closer, or mm -hmm. you know, what does a straight line tell me? Lightspeed was actually a Tom Jolly game that he brought to me as a you know, play a card and think about it kind of game. And as the as more and more spaceships got out in play, every turn got more and more difficult because you're trying to right. interpret what the firing order of all the ones that are already there. And I said, well, I've done some real-time games. Let's take the turns out of it. And everyone slapped their cards down all at once. And then mm -hmm. the paralysis is gone. And then you can just slap them down and then find out what happens. It's really chaotic and fun. Right, I love the game. Yeah. Real-time games. How come nobody makes more real-time games? Because um, I, I hit him with a lawsuit every time. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, it's they're very hard to do. And they I, are. I, I talked to somebody at DigiPen. Um, this is a computer game mm -hmm. college that I lectured at for for a, a, a semester. And before that, I was a guest speaker. I talked to one of the inventors there, who said I tried to come up with a real time card game, mm -hmm. and it was brawl. Like there's nothing I could do that was <laughs> that better wasn't. than what oh. I had already seen. And that, I don't know if that's happening to a lot of people, but it's sort of like I did. Falling First, which yes. is the real-time game that has a dealer to kind of adjudicate the, mm -hmm. the problems in timing. And then I did Brawl, where it's just two players that don't need a dealer, and that was kind of a nice uh, invention. And we did, Mike Sellerk and I did Fight Ball. Um, right, yeah. We did Lightspeed, the real-time game. Mm -hmm. um, I've sort of covered a lot of ways to do it that maybe people look at that and go, well, I can't improve on that, so I'm not going to yeah, try. And there, there have been some. Yeah, have you played Jab? No. You should try Jab. It's uh, by one of our friends, Gavin. Uh, Gavin Brown out in Calgary. It's published by Tasty Mitchell Game, and it's I see it as kind of the evolution of what you started. Right, right. Because before before Brawl and Falling, there weren't a lot of games that played like that. The only so I was trying to make a card game that played like a video game. Mm -hmm. That was kind of like the impetus to to yeah. do Brawl and Falling. Um, but the only real time game 
or turnless game mm -hmm. that I had played prior to that was Ice House, Andy Looney's oh, Ice yeah, House. Yeah. And that's very pensive and slow, mm -hmm. and everyone's going at the same time, yeah. but there's not like a, a rush. Yeah. And so I say, well, okay, I know that a turnless game can be made. Let's see yeah. what I can do with that. Um, and that's, you know, following, mm -hmm. following was actually inspired by, I was walking around Gen Con, and I thought of the ad for the game. I just thought of I, I thought of I sell this a game? sign that said "Falling Rocks" and somebody had fallen past it and put an exclamation point uh -huh. after rocks. I can still see the cover yeah, in yeah. my right. head. And I was like, now I got to make a game about falling. What would that yeah. be? Yeah. And that's kind of what led me to make the the, the game. Button Men. Button Men. You want to know the origin story of Button Men? I, I do because I have all these games in my basement. Yeah, I love. I so love Button Men is so. a two-player dice combat game. Real yeah. simple, real easy to to, to explain and. The origin for that was there was a restaurant that wanted me to make games that would fit on their coasters. That's funny. Um, <laughs> He's made multiple games for that. Yeah. Coaster games, yeah. Um, it's and what they wanted was rules that rules that fit on coasters. So they, like, I was uh, doing nice. business card sized games and so on, really mm -hmm. simple rules. So they wanted to print the rules on the coasters, and I gave them a, so a set of four games where the rules were were short. But after I delivered those, I was like. I think I know what you really want, which yeah. is a game where the character is a coaster, yeah. and once you know the rules, you don't really need the rules anymore, right. or you put the rules on the back or whatever. Yeah. But this was a restaurant next to a game store, and they sold dice. Oh. And so if I give you a coaster that needs five dice, go buy five dice, yeah. right? Yeah. That was like, the in, the instantiation of that game was as a, as a free way to sell dice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and the restaurant was like, ah, I don't really want this. And I was like, great, I don't have a restaurant, I don't want to make coasters, I don't know how to do it, this <laughs> yeah. game. So we figured out to put it on buttons and to call it Button Men, which yeah. was like so, I'm so happy when I came up with that. Um, and say, well, we won't sell the dice, but we'll sell the buttons in a sort of a... Which is true to, very true to the cheap-ass kind right. of format, I mean, right? You know, 250 for a button was still kind of expensive, but it's like, i got to sell you something. Yeah. Um, but the game is free. You can download the characters mm -hmm. now. I'm looking at a way to do like a 50-card deck of new button man characters as a little, like an introduction cool. to the game. I, I would play that. Yeah, that would be really <laughs> cool. Um, and I keep talking about it, but I can only do about two games a year, and I have so many games I want to do. Yeah. It's it's quite a funny. I, we have a friend, Jesse, one of our uh, co-designers, the guy that I, I make games with, and that's a member of our Game Artisans of Canada group. Um, and I I always say, you know, Jesse, you're you're too clever by about an ounce. Uh, and then I always refer him to your games. <laughs> no, 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 not in the way that you're not clever by an ounce, but by the way that if his you want to dial it back a little bit, let me show you some of James Ernest's catalog. That but that work in the same way that he thinks. Uh -huh but work and translate well to people. How do you write your rules? Because your rules are just very short, sweet, simple, and bam, well, there you go. So before I was a game designer, I was a technical writer. I, that helps. I, I, did a, I did a juggling instruction book. I did some editing work uh, and some writing work. Can you juggle? Yeah. Um, for Wizards of the Coast in 93, I was actually a freelancer for Wizards. There you go. I compiled a digest of Magic the Gathering L, MTGL, yeah. on Rec Games Board. And I also wrote and compiled um, the multiplayer variants for the Pocket Player's Guide, and I wrote the core rules for that game four times. Like, that was that was my job. And once you've wow. written the rules for a trading card game, you can write the rules to anything. Like, it's it's just a matter of practice like anything else. Right. It's, but, but those things are hard. It's, they are. The more you explain something, the more confusing you can get. So you have to be as tight with your wording as possible, because every word you write is, is a word that can be misunderstood. Right. Excellent. That, that's really good advice for the designers out there watching. Um, take a look at some of James's rules, play the games, and see if you can actually misinterpret anything. Because it's, it's <laughs> if, actually... If you work at it, you can. But like a lot of people, hard. people will ask me rules questions about a thing that they find ambiguous. And what I want to tell all of them is, all right, yes, you could potentially misread this to, to be method A or method B. But run it the other way. If it was really method B, would I have written it like this, or would yeah. I have used the words that you're using to ask me questions about how the rule works? Right? Yeah, that's a really um, good point, right? Anything else you want to talk about before we're done here? Most important thing that's happening right now is we're gearing up to kickstart the 20th anniversary edition of Kill Dr. Lucky. Yes, it's been 19 years, but 20th is easier to write than 19 yeah. and a half. Um, and that's going to kickstart in the fall. It's a Perfect. new version of the game. It's got. It's going to look like Get Lucky, which is the card game. Yep. It's going to be illustrated by the same artist. Nice. And it's, so it's going to look like it's part of that family. 
I'm sort of streamlining the look of the game mm -hmm. as if it's sort of a hundred year old game you might have bought in a dime store in 1910. But also, we are taking this chance to fix a lot of the rules. Like, Dr. Lucky's really popular, but there are some problems with the way it plays. It's very sure. popular in terms of its simplicity and its theme, but there's parts of the mechanic that have always sort of bothered me, and we've taken sort of half measures at, at sort of fixing that in multiple editions, but this one is a serious rebuild. If you haven't played the game in 10 years, you won't see any of the changes. If you know it really well, you will see lots of nips and tucks, and I'm gonna publish um, kind of a retrospective of why the changes got made and what they all are, but the game is much more about tactics now, it's much more about what you expect, and mm -hmm. less about sort of gaming the rules as they are. Right. Yeah, it's cool. Okay, so last question. What's one piece of advice that you would give to a novice designer or a designer trying to get their game out? Well, trying to get your game out is a whole different problem than trying to design a good game. Okay, and let's talk about designing a good so game then. So for design, game design is an art like anything else that you need to do a lot of times to get good at it. You cannot work on one game for 10 years and expect it to get good. You have to work on 100 games in 10 years. And I, you know, I had the luxury of publishing a lot of my crap designs, but over that time, and in working on lots of different kinds of games that don't seem to interrelate, I have learned so much more about game design just by doing it. You mm -hmm. have to do it. Mm -hmm. And are you going to publish a book on that at any point in time? I want to. Um, I'd buy it. <laughs> the notes for the class that I wrote for DigiPen are the outline for a design book that I want to do. And I've, I've pretty much put that on the schedule for this fall. I'm going to write a design book this fall as, and set it up as a textbook so that it can be used in classes like that. Excellent. So there you have it, folks. James Ernest, Cheap Ass Games. Look for the Kickstarter for Kill Dr. Lucky coming up in fall 2015. Look for any of his stuff because it really is a testament to how you can design games kind of on a shoestring budget and make it something that happens and iterate and iterate and iterate and make lots and lots of games and learn from whatever you do. Whether it's positive or negative, you're going to learn something. So thanks, James, for coming on the show, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks.